Thanks very much, Daisy, for that lovely introduction, and thank you for the kind invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the exhibit. I haven't seen it yet. I should have uh, actually uh, made some references in my talk to the exhibit. But if, 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 if you've seen it and you want to ask questions, then I'm quite happy to, to uh, well, improvise something. I'm sure I can manage. Um, so food, drink, and the maintenance of health. Um, when it comes to the relationship between food and health, we're more like our early modern forebears than it might seem. Oh, and I should say early modern, 1500 to 1800. We historians use that as, as a label, uh, however inappropriate it might be. Anyway, we have, if we can believe the hype, entered the new era of precision medicine tailored to the individual. The, this boasts of being able to offer us personalized nutrition using information on our own distinct characteristics to produce targeted nutritional advice in order to benefit health. The potential market is huge. We all have to eat and we all want to stay healthy. And a particularly uh, lucrative strand of this is the field of nutritional genomics. Hope I'm not offending anybody here, but it thrives in this world of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. And through this, nutritional advice and strategies can be tailored to suit our own individual genetic makeup. The idea being to prevent, treat, and manage conditions like, well, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. And this may seem like a brave new world, but the pressing concerns over the food and drink we ingest, the focus on the individual's makeup, and the role of diet in disease prevention were all equally evident during the early modern period. So how did early modern Europeans decide what to eat and drink and what not to? What factors shaped these decisions? So these are the kinds of questions that I'd, I'd like to address focusing on printed sources of health advice with regard to food consumption. So I'll look at the changing nature of the genre itself. It's a literary genre, the sort of advice that it provided, as well as some of the key factors which were supposed to shape people's individual relationship with food and drink. Things like taste, gender, place, occupation, social rank. And then I'll try to conclude this by attempting to gauge how early modern, or to what extent early modern Europeans engaged with this advice. So let me start by outlining the regimen or, or dietary genre. Notions surrounding the preservation of health went back to the ancient idea of hygiene. Of course, this isn't uh, simply uh, cleanliness, but uh, from the Greek hygeia, literally health. The belief that um, staying healthy had a lot to do with one's way of life. <clears throat> and individuals were encouraged to regulate a whole range of different factors like the quality of the air, uh, the food and, uh, and drink intake, motion and rest, sleep and waking, repletion and evacuation, and strong emotions or passions. These factors were collectively known as the six non-naturals, at least uh, in medical circles. And individuals could regulate these in their everyday lives uh, as part of a widespread culture of disease prevention. To understand why the six non-naturals affected each person differently, I need to give a sort of just potted uh, history description of Galenic medicine. So apologies to those of you who, who know this stuff. Um, but it's going to help us with the, 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 the sort of uh, advice, to how to make sense of, of the advice that I want to talk about. And it's based on physiological principles that remained more or less intact throughout the Renaissance. In fact, right through to the early 1600s when they're first challenged by chemical medicine. I'll have something more to say about that. 
and then by mechanical medicine as we go into the 18th century. So the first thing we need to know was that the body was understood to be regulated by four basic fluids or humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile or choler, and black bile or melancholy or black, uh, um, and health was the proportional balance of these fluids. Uh, when they were out of uh, kilter, out of balance, uh, you got sick. And secondly, each person was born with a predominance of a particular humor, or at least a tendency for that humor to be developed in excess. So people with a predominance of the blood humor would be characterized as sanguine, um, or they could be phlegmatic or choleric or melancholic. These are all terms we, we still use. And an individual's humoral makeup could be called a complexion or a temperament or a constitution determined the diseases to which they might be a subject. It also determined their character and their emotional state. And finally, it determined what sort of diet they should uh, adopt in order to stay healthy, in order to counter some of these uh, predispositions, if you like. And this was because, and, and this is actually the third point, each humor had qualitative properties. So blood was considered to be hot and moist. Phlegm was considered to be cold and moist. Collar was hot and dry, and melancholy was cold and dry. These properties weren't so much tactile measurements of, of temperature or humidity, because they couldn't measure those things anyway, uh, as the effect each humor was supposed to have on the body, was perceived to have on the body. And there's one, one final aspect of, of Galenic physiology that we need to understand. And that's that this system, this humoral system, had its parallels throughout the natural world. Just as human bodies were regulated by the four humors, so all organic matter, including animals and plants and, and so foods, were composed of elements that gave them their own humoral properties. And these were called qualities, or facultates in the Latin. So in the same way that a person could be called phlegmatic, so a cucumber, I had cucumber salad for lunch, so that's, a cucumber could be described as cold and moist in its qualities. Uh, and these qualities shaped the nature and content of dietary advice. Um, especially as it circulated in print form. So let me say something about that. In 1525, the Venetian uh, printer uh, and librarian, Aldo Manuzio, published the complete works of Galen of Pergamum. I'm sure you've all heard of him. He died 200 AD. Uh, as part of a widespread cultural initiative to rediscover the works of the ancient authorities who were considered, along with uh, Christianity, of course, the main source of knowledge uh, in a wide range of different fields. And this included what, we would, what would prove to be the two most influential works on early modern regimen. Galen's hygiene, known in Latin as de sanitate tuenda, or on the preservation of health, and his de alimentorum facultatibus, or on the faculties of uh, elements, or faculties, powers, qualities, or for elements, also foodstuffs, that's a challenge of translation. The result of this publication was a Galenic revival, uh, persisting well into the 1600s, which meant that uh, Renaissance medical ideas about health and foods adhered more strictly to the theories of Galen than ever before or, or since. And the Galenic approach, as it was revived in the Renaissance, so the end of the uh, 15th century, um, put diet at the forefront. 
To quote the uh, Spanish doctor and theologian Álvarez de Miraval, writing in 1601, almost all of the maintenance of our health consists in the good ordering and administration of food and drink. So what, what, Galenic, this, what the Galenic revival does is rather than talk about all those other six non-naturals that I mentioned, you know, the evacuations, the rest, the passions, their focus is on food. Certain basic nutritional ideas about food were held by all of the authors uh, who wrote regimens over the period, from the late 1400s to well into the 1600s. And then even throughout the challenges of chemical medicine and mechanical medicine. So this takes us well into the uh, eight, uh, well, 18th century, but even, even further. So the first of these basic, uh, basic nutritional ideas was that bread, bread was absolutely essential for proper nourishment. It wasn't just the staff of life. It was considered a kind of glue that kept all the other foods in place. Writing in the 1590s, the English physician Thomas Muffet believed bread to be indispensable to good concoction. And concoction refers to the cooking of foods in the stomach. It's before our modern uh, theory or, or, or view of, of digestion. Without bread, he says, all other meats, by meats he means foods in general, all other foods would either quickly putrefy in our stomachs or sooner pass through them than they should. Meat, here in the sense of animal flesh, was equally important since nourishment was defined as the ability for a food to be converted into the substance and fabric of the human body those substances that were most similar to the body were also considered to be the most nourishing, and so the most healthy. That's the logic. But to quote Muffet again, because animal flesh is in substance and essence most like our own, it can, with least loss and labor of natural heat, be converted and transubstantiated into our flesh. Almost a religious language there transubstantiated. That said, not all meats were equal. Uh, and a weaker, more sedentary individual, such as a student or a scholar, and I'll be re returning to these people later, uh, would require lighter meats than, say, a well-exercised laborer. So if meat was good, fish was not. Fish qualified as a nutritious form of flesh, but its cold and moist qualities, like the element in which fish, fish lived uh, and their excessively gluey texture, that's a word they use a lot, gluey, meant that they could provoke an overabundance of phlegm in the body. Remember, phlegm is cold and moist. Worse still, fish might get stuck at some stage during the process of concoction and then form a clog or a blockage in the body. This is considered one of the major causes of disease, from gout to, to fevers. To counteract these harmful effects, you needed to use proper seasonings or condiments to accompany the fish. So to counter the phlegmatic quality, so lemons, heating spices, sugar. These were all seasonings that would cut through the gluey substance of the fish and balance its coldness and were thought of as medicinal ingredients rather than just flavor enhancers. And as this use of condiments to temper the harmful effects of fish suggests, Another widely held notion was that any potentially unhealthy food could be corrected. That was the word they used. In other words, adjusted to make it suitable for consumption, to make it healthy. So Renaissance nutritional theory incorporated a culinary system. The abundant use of spices, which we associate with 
the medieval and Renaissance periods, you know, think black pepper and stuff like that. Um, particularly on foods classified as cold or difficult to digest, to digest um, it quite probably has a medical origin rather than a specifically culinary one. Um, the idea that most, that moist foods, sorry, moist foods like fresh pork or lamb should be roasted to dry them out. Or that dry foods should be boiled to increase the moisture content. All of this acquires a certain logic within the Galenic system. It's about balancing. Each procedure made a dish a more humorally balanced whole, and so more easily assimilated into the body, and more fit to nourish the body. And this approach is most evident with regard to fruit and veg. Because uh, dietary authors in the Renaissance period abhor fruit and veg. It's dangerous. Um, they're too cold, too watery uh, for frequent consumption. And they offer little by way of nourishment. So they produce only a watery, thin blood. Um, it doesn't mean that they were opposed to fruit and veg per se. So if you were of a hot complexion, you could eat fruit and veg. Or if it was summer, you could because the climate is having an effect on your body as well. So the fruit and veg would cool it down. That's OK. Um, or to accompany hot foods, fruit and veg might be OK. Um, but otherwise, it was best if they were cooked and really cooked. I mean, that's probably what the, the tradition of, of uh, you know, overcooking vegetables probably stems from this period. And then they had to be corrected with spices, so, so lots of pepper, lots of oil, things like that, to dry them out. And if you were a laborer, it was also OK to eat fruit and veg. I'll return to laborers and, and, and the working class in a, in a few minutes. And a word about beverages. We distinguish between food and drink, um, but in early modern Europe, both were included under the same rubric as, as things ingested into the body, which provided nourishment, in addition to the moisture they provided. So drinks like wine and beer were considered foods because they fed the body. So you've already helped to feed your body already this evening. Um, they may have disagreed, the medical authors may have disagreed on the relative merits of wine, ale, beer, cider, various spirits, because this often depended on where those authors were from. Um, but they did agree on one thing, that their consumption was beneficial to the elderly. It's great reading these, things, these books, because the older you get, the more you can drink. Yeah. Wine in particular heated the cooling bodies of aging people, expelled their sadness and melancholy, brought on sleep, and eased constipation. <laughs> what more could you ask for? Um, in the words of Thomas Eliot, who's looking quite young here, uh, God did ordain wine for mankind as a remedy against the incommodities of age. So we've got kind of generalized dietary advice, but that's only uh, the first ingredient in concocting a health regimen. Just as important was adapting it to fit the specific physical makeup, habits, needs, preferences of each individual. Foods like cheese and wine might be converted into nourishing foods in some bodies, but could be poisons in others. Accurate diagnosis of the individual, whether one did this oneself or through ongoing consultation with a doctor, was uh, it, crucial for a tailor-made uh, regimen for each person. It, crucial for tailoring the regimen to the individual. There's no way, there could be no 
set of prescribed nutritional guidelines that were valid for everyone. There was no idea of good or bad foods that, well, good or bad foods, full stop, because it, it depended how they were consumed and who was consuming them and in what time of the year and so on. But how to square the circle between the generalized health advice presented in these printed regimens, I should say the printed regimens, they're published in their hundreds during this period. It's over a thousand titles. Um, so how to square the circle between the generalized health advice they're giving and the very personalized nature of their application. It resulted in this curious paradox of guides to health being published which individual readers were expected to be able to interpret and adapt according to their own needs. Matching the proper foods to the individual was the key to this whole system. And the authors of these texts um, approached the problem of individuality in different ways different uh, publishing strategies, you might say. So they could write a book, target their book to a specific audience. So in the case of, of the one uh, on your left is, is uh, specific, is, is for magistrates and students, basically scholars, studious people. So specific groups, professions. Or you could write to the inhabitants of specific cities. So here uh, is a frontispiece of a book dedicated to people living in Rome. So all relates to the site of the city, the climate. Um, uh, one for Genoa, there's one for Venice, there's one for Lisbon, one for Paris, anyway. Or you could write to specific, uh, for specific age groups, like the elderly. Uh, or to be more exact, people who wanted to live to a ripe old age, which is, of course, you know, <laughs> everyone. Um, and readers could always find advice that was specific enough to their own bodies to make the regimen relevant to them. The demand for information and guidance certainly existed, and medical authors rushed to satisfy it. And they made their regimens and health guides accessible by writing in the vernacular, first of all. They wrote in the language of the place, not in Latin. It's curious, some of the titles were first published in the vernacular and then translated into Latin, but their first market, their market was broader than that. And they developed enticing titles for these books. Haven of Health, Medicinal Anchor, Health's Improvement, Portrait of Health, as well as more prosaic preservation of health. I mean, that's coming right from Galen. And then the publishers participated by printing these volumes in very inexpensive formats. Uh, Thomas Moulton's Mirror or Glass of Health, which went through at least 17 editions between 1530 and 1580, was as cheap as any book on the market. And although the genre itself had its ups and downs in terms of publishing success, linked to the ups and downs of preventive medicine and more broadly, it did hold sway throughout the early modern period. Uh, take a book by Castore Durante, a Roman physician, Il Tesoro della Sanità, or The Treasure of Health, was first published in Rome in 1586. It then went through an extraordinary 34 editions in Italy over the next 93 years. The last uh, Italian edition is in 1679. It then acquires a second life in, in an English translation. And a copy of this translation, published in 1686, the one you see here, was inscribed by a William Davis in 1798. Not that this literature was unchanging, actually quite the contrary. Uh, I've mentioned already, no, no sooner had Galenism, classical medicine of Galen, been revived in the Renaissance, uh, that uh, you know, 
producing this whole notion of dietetics that I've been talking about, no sooner this happened than there were challenges to it. Um, the first, most notable, I guess, is, is chemical medicine. Think of think Paracelsus, um, which saw the body and disease in terms of chemical processes and wasn't really interested in preventive medicine very much. And then the second major development is, is mechanical medicine. Think, uh, think Descartes, think uh, the body as machine. Uh, neither of these, neither chemical medicine nor mechanical medicine, brought about a, a revolution. There was no sudden abandonment of Galenism. Uh, indeed, older humoral notions persisted right into the 19th century, even if shorn of explicit references to the underlying system of the humors. But even as we move to a more generalized health advice in the 18th century, individual readers were still recommended to apply, to apply it to their own circumstances. So what were some of the factors that enabled people to navigate their way through the advice regarding what sort of food, what sort of diet would, was healthy for them. Now, throughout the period, taste. Taste, both in the sense of flavor and in the sense of personal preferences, was considered a reliable indicator Michel de Montaigne, always a good idea to quote Michel de Montaigne. He wrote in 1580, nothing hurts me that I eat with appetite and delight. Whereas whatever I take against my liking does me harm. Really nice advice, Dan. Personal taste could change too. Shifts that accompany changes in one's bodily circumstances, either through aging or illness. To quote Montaigne again, my appetite in various things has of its own accord happily enough accommodated itself to the health of my stomach. Relish and pungency and sauces were pleasant to me when young. My stomach, disliking them since, my taste incontinently followed. Taste was the most important criterion for assigning foods their respective qualities. <clears throat> So uh, sweet and savory or, or meaty flavors usually led to those foods being classified as hot and moist. And because heat and moisture were the two fundamental requisites for life, these foods were also considered the most nourishing. Milder flavors, like chicken, were considered more temperate, possessing moderate heating and warming qualities. So if the taste of individual foodstuffs was a guide to their effects on the body, the individual person's reactions to those foodstuffs, his or her tastes, in the sense of preferences, was regarded as a reliable guide to whether they were healthy or not. Uh, Moffat, again, he devotes an entire section of his book to discussing how meats, meaning foods, differ in taste. And here are the different flavors of foods, the many kinds of tastes that be found in nourishments, he says, meet the different tastes in the sense of preferences of individuals, their sympathies, antipathies, and, to quote him again, inborn tasting and distasting. The close association between taste and digestibility is apparent in the work of Tobias Venner, for whom it's pretty much a rule. A food of unpleasant taste is therefore noisome, harmful, to the stomach. And a food of pleasant or delicate taste is invariably light of digestion and of good nourishment. And this link persisted throughout the whole period. As late as 1778, William Faulkner noted how, and I quote, taste seems to be the index or sign of the substance being agreeable to the stomach or fit for digestion. Just as foods disagreeable to the pal palate seldom digest well 
or contribute to the nourishment of the body. What about women's tastes? Women's tastes were naturally different from men's. Women were regarded as being generally colder and moister than men in complexion. This was used to explain why women were considered softer, weaker, less intelligent. Sorry, I'm just the messenger. Um, so medical theory was clearly an evident tool of, uh, was clearly a tool of subjugation with its roots in Aristotelian philosophy. But what's interesting for us here is that it meant that a woman's diet should be different from a man's. The problem is most um, of the dietary literature was written by men for other men and so rarely dealt specifically with women's needs. No re Renaissance regimen was published with women specifically in mind. The closest we get is that some regimens, like the one I mentioned by Castore Durante, Tesoro della Sanità, was dedicated to a woman patron. So presumably he had um, a kind of possible uh, female readership in mind. And Durante, in fact, argued that women would be able to learn the rule of healthy living, both for their own sakes, to care for their own health, but also to care for the health of others, which was the, the woman's role in this period. It was only in 1771 that the first regimen dedicated entirely to women appeared, Le Médecin des Dames, the women's doctor. Um, but it's address, it addresses women not as you, readers, but as them. <laughs> and it's, so it's assuming a male readership may be treating women. So uh, here we, we're back to the role of, of authority, of, of men uh, having the authoritative role. Um, so in addition to taste, and gender, which I haven't been able to say very much, where you lived was also a factor. It was also expected to shape one's food intake in the preservation of health and the prevention of disease. And this link was physiological. Classical dietary theory held that individuals were best nourished by the foods to which they were accustomed. And these were most often the foods that grew in their region. With long use, these foods became assimilated into the very fabric of people's bodies. And this held true even if one's usual food was not particularly good. It's not about the quality of the food in our modern sense. As the anonymous author of the Régime de Vivre put it, the food that one is accustomed to eating whether in and of itself it is bad or harmful, is nevertheless better and more suitable for the body than good food to which it is unaccustomed. It followed, though, that a shift in the pattern, in what you're eating, what you're accustomed to eating, a shift in this pattern would upset the body's equilibrium, resulting in ill health. Travel puts your body at risk, and I don't just mean going through Gatwick Airport. <laughs> In 1575, a Saxon lawyer and enthusiastic traveler, Hieronymus Turler, warned the two young German students for whom his book was written that like plants uprooted and planted in different soil, they might grow out of kind, losing their natural quality, color, and taste. So a change in the air and diet that compasseth them, that surrounds them, would bring about a change in their very constitution and temperament leading in turn to a change in behavior and interests. By this means, concluded Turler, 
A Dane is transformed into a Spaniard. A German into a Frenchman or Italian. Namely by daily conversation, use of life and custom. In the short term, sudden changes to air and diet upset the body's equilibrium, a normal pattern, risking illness. In the long term, prolonged exposure could lead to changes in one's very self. If dietary change posed a very real uh, health risk to travel within Europe, spare a thought for those Europeans who ventured over the ocean sea to the new world. Recreating and keeping to the familiar was easier said than done in the early years of European settlement. What about over the longer term and the generations that followed? Well, from a Galenic point of view, if the food people ate helped to determine their very natures, then it followed that the children born of Europeans in the New World would be constitutionally similar to their forebears if they continued to eat the same foods. And this was good because it meant they didn't have to worry about going native, which was a real preoccupation uh, for Europeans in the New World. So anyway, thought the Spanish physician Diego Cisneros, comparing Spaniards and Creoles, that's to say Spaniards, uh, people of Spanish heritage born in the Indies or the New World, uh, Cisneros wrote that, and I quote, where there is such similarity in diet, the, the complexion and natural temperament cannot alter. Just how much New World food was admissible, though, remained a moot point. The avocado, it seems, was safe. One author said, a very good fruit and healthy for Spaniards. Staple foods like maize, uh, staple food of the native population, should be said, and another New World plant was much more problematic. That's another story. Back in Europe, social rank is another factor I have to mention, another factor in shaping dietary choices. The basic assumption was that one should eat according to one's quality, and here I, I mean that in terms of social rank. The presumed physiological characteristics and cultural customs of each individual in society. So the wealthy and powerful ate refined foods and elaborate dishes because it singled them out as, as wealthy and powerful. They're able to do that. But these were also the foods that best suited their complexions, their physical makeup. The urban and rural poor, common and coarse by nature, were left with common and coarse foods. Not only was medical advice consistent with this ideology, it also contributed to it. Moffat makes frequent class references with regard to foods. So rye, the cereal, rye, heavy of digestion, he says, was suitable for laborers, servants, and workmen. Herring. Herring was best left to plowmen, sailors, soldiers, mariners, or laboring persons to whom gross and heavy foods are most familiar and convenient. Conversely, there was no food so wholesome as pheasant at least for the elites. But he goes on, to strong stomachs, it is inconvenientest, especially to plowmen and laborers who, eating of pheasants, fall suddenly into sickness and shortness of breath. And by extension, there's a whole range of foods that were banned, increasingly banned during the Renaissance period from elite tables because of their association uh, with those who toiled, who labored. So a number of foods that were frequently acceptable or that found their places into the, the recipe books of the late Middle Ages, porridges, gruels, pottages, beans, increasingly these are regulated to the category of, food, category of foods for the laboring poor. 
And partly this, this seems to happen because the diet of the poor got substantially worse during the early modern period. Uh, and it certain foods became increasingly associated with the poor alone. They became obvious symbols of poverty, and to eat these foods, to eat these foods became an act of debasement, especially for the elites who ought to have been able to afford better. Several regimens were devoted especially to, particular, to a particular class of people. I've mentioned already this, this notion of, of students and scholars, um, which probably includes all of us here. I don't know. But, um, mental exertion itself was considered um, a serious threat to health especially combined with a sedentary lifestyle and a predisposition to melancholy. Thinking, thinking was actually believed to disturb the digestive process, which is why you're never supposed to study right after a meal. Excessive study also exhausted the body, leaving no energy left for processing food, for concoction. Uh, by contrast, in the words of Guglielmo Grattaroli, uh, from the English translation, orderly diet, orderly diet, emphasis on orderly there, orderly diet quickeneth the spirits and reviveth the mind, making it more active and courageous to know and practice virtuous operations. So in addition to favoring light foods, the scholar was advised to beware of foods harmful to the brain, Onions, garlic, whose fumes smothered the intellect and understanding. Or poorly prepared food, that could also spoil one's thoughts. And, and gluttony, obviously, that was out because that was lethal to the intellect. Um, so medical authors essentially are aiming their works at literate, pe literate people, people with the leisure and financial means to think about their health. So think middling and upper ranks of, of society. Uh, Joseph Duchesne, who practiced medicine uh, widely before being appointed physician to the French king Henri IV, was quite explicit about uh, what he thought his readership was. Seeking here to address myself particularly to the rich not to the poor and laborers for whom such regimens are not suited since they do not have the means to put them into practice, obliged to live as they can and not as they want. And that's to say quite badly and unthinkingly instead of well and medically. The poor apparently didn't have the luxury of making choices about their health. As a result, there was no point in writing for them. Luckily, there was no need either, for they were healthy enough already. So wrote the Coimbra professor, uh, Fernando Rodriguez Cardoso, in 1620, in his study of the six non-naturals. He explains that the regular habits of laborers and the exercise they got uh, at their jobs was enough to keep them well. And yet a handful of authors did write with the poor in mind, with an imagined readership that was actually not the poor like themselves, but for those who might have responsibility uh, for their care. The Parisian physician uh, Jacques Dubois was driven to write a short health regimen for the poor uh, by, and I quote, the calamity and wretchedness of the poor both in this city of Paris as in other towns and villages. Dubois was thinking here mostly of, of, of laborers. The role of the doctors was, the doctor treating these people, uh, wasn't to advise the avoidance of excess and all the other uh, usual niceties of, of uh, the genre, uh, rather to assist them in finding sufficient nourishment. Dubois recommended very simple foods like soups and stews made of root vegetables and herbs, bits of offal and stale bread or cereals, 
which had the advantage that, and I quote, they are of great nourishment and last a long time in the body. Medical ideas linking social rank, physiology, and diet persisted throughout the period. Uh, the British military surgeon, Andrew Harper, was still recommending that the children of poor people be fed only plain and substantial food, avoiding rarities. And this was to prevent their stomachs from becoming too nice. I think he means delicate, which would only be against their own best interests, as they were likely to live hard. For our authors, an interest in the intricacies of the regimen advice, to say nothing of the wherewithal to put it into practice, presumed a degree of wealth, leisure, and education. So they addressed a limited readership. The intended beneficiaries, to judge from the, the, the book titles and their dedications and the introductions, were princes, magistrates, scholars, as we've seen, but also tradesmen and artisans. And, and during the 18th century, this, this readership swelled to include the rising bourgeoisie. But there's something to add before we just give up, and that's access to information in early modern Europe was always wider, broader than just those who were literate, who could read the text for themselves. Um, a book could pass through many hands, but often books were read aloud to groups of people and transmitted orally. Um, so literacy, these are, the early modern period is, is a world where literacy and illiteracy overlaps. There's no kind of one or the other. Uh, information did circulate widely. So what about engaging with this advice? As we might know from personal experience, um, but as the field of behavioral medicine certainly teaches, even if we know what the best advice in relation to diet and nutrition it, it is, applying it to our own daily routines is another matter entirely. Well, I speak personally, so. <laughs> Tackling this difficult question as it applies to the early modern period would seem a, a fitting way to end this talk. And it was a commonplace in the period, commonplace among physicians at least, that people didn't take heed of dietary advice, or actually of their own health in general. You know, they only ever saw the doctor when it was too late. And this was a mixture of the truth, probably, uh, at least as the medical authors uh, saw it. But it was also a rhetorical strategy to claim the reader's attention and maybe to sell a few copies as well. So we have the English royal physician John Archer, never one to undersell himself or his own abilities. He was well aware that, and I'm quoting uh, from his introduction, people of all qualities do commonly feed upon what comes to table, be what it will, without considering the nature or qualities of anything, or agreements or disagreements to their constitutions, so it do but please their palate. But in so doing, Archer warned, they do dig their graves with their teeth. <laughs> so a not very subtle message, which is, buy my book if you don't want to suffer the same fate. And in some copies of the book, he's inscribed his address where you can contact him. It's kind of handy. Um, so an understanding of regimen enabled lay people to correlate two crucial aspects of their lives everyday bodily habits, and their own anxieties about health. It's certainly easier for the historian to demonstrate the importance of regimen in a general sense and how it played a, a role in people's lives than to show a clear link to specific texts. 
For example, uh, Gilles de Gouberville, uh, was a well-fed country squire in Normandy, routinely diagnosed and treated, uh, 16th century, I think, routinely diagnosed and treated his own ailments. Uh, both the cause and the cure was always food, which is kind of nice. Um, and uh, his diary of the artist, the Florentine artist, uh, Jacomo Pontorno, is, is full of details about his paintings, the paintings he's working on. So he's always, the diary's always been of interest to art historians. But actually, it's also full of references to what he's eaten. He tells us what every meal, what he's eating. He tells us what illnesses he's suffering from, all the symptoms. He tells us about the weather, because of course that is a, uh, an influence. And he gives us lots of detail about his bowel movements, which maybe he could have spared us. But he's demonstrating a familiarity throughout with the dietary treatises and health guides. Existing medical knowledge was known about, it was followed, or at least it was engaged with by those sections of society who had the means, at least, to make food choices. There's historical evidence of both the desire to learn about and follow such advice, just as there's evidence of a resistance to the detailed minutiae of it. We shouldn't expect early modern Europeans to be the passive recipients of medical advice either just as they weren't uh, you know, passive in the medical encounter. Bespoke dietary advice could be the subject of intense negotiation, even rejection. Take the Duchess of Saxony, Elizabeth of Rockless, who kept a, a detailed account of her illnesses and medical treatments, thankfully for historians like us. Um, one of her doctors wrote to Elizabeth that, and I quote, medicament without regimen cannot bring true health. So, you know, it's all about prevention here. Fair enough, but to treat her flux in the breast, the same doctor recommended that she avoid as unhealthy onions, garlic, mustard, horseradish, food seasoned with pepper, cinnamon, cardamom, and other fragrant spices, spoke meat, fish, and game, all stuffed dishes, all fruits, foods fried in butter, as well as beans, lentils, and sauerkraut. Now, in Germany, I don't know what else is left. So, uh, those are the options, the culinary options. And Elizabeth, we know, was a lover of food and drink, and she disliked any form of strict dietary regulation, and she rarely kept to the regimen that the doctors imposed uh, for more than a few days. As she writes at one point, food and drink still taste good to us. And as proof of this, we ate five game birds for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also evidence of increasing dissatisfaction in learned circles with the fundamental nature of dietary advice. An exact ordering of our life and diet, such progeny, tediousness, and inconvenience. Those are the words of the philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon. And in a similar vein, Montaigne again, writing of his lifelong search for knowledge by experience, reveals his own failure to follow dietary rules, trusting his own personal experience over the strictures of the learned doctors. Experience was the best guide to what habits and foods were best for one, and which one should be avoided, whereas the usefulness of medical advice was limited, so Montaigne believed. And as if to answer some of these concerns, when there was a renewal of the regimen genre in the 18th century, it shed most of the exactness, the tedium, of the Renaissance regimens. And it was replaced by more generalized and simplified rules of life. As in George Cheney, I couldn't end a talk 
uh, in Edinburgh without mentioning the Scottish doctor, George Cheney. And we have numerous examples of people attempting to follow, uh, to follow Cheney's dietary uh, regimens, from the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, to the writer and printer, Samuel Richardson. Wesley attempted to follow Cheney's dietary advice himself. He also wrote about it, encouraging the readers of his primitive physic, 1747, and I quote, to observe all the time the greatest exactness in your regimen or manner of living. And then he provides his readers with a list, and I quote, of plain easy rules, briefly transcribed from Dr. Cheney. Richardson was, uh, well, by contrast, admitted to being, in his words, a staunch epicure and to disliking exercise, and was noticeably less successful than Wesley in followed, following Cheney's advice to relax, eat and drink less, and to exercise. And finally, consultation letters. These are a great source for historians of medicine. Consultation letters written between doctors and their patients demonstrate that a knowledge of dietary principles remained widespread among the educated classes, despite shifts in medical philosophy. Oh, I should say consultation by letter was, especially in the 18th century, a common form of medical encounter. Uh, a study of some 2,500 letters to and from French doctors during the period 1655 to 1789 has found that patients were almost always advised to adopt dietary restrictions in order to regain their health. The letter writers were certainly aware of the regimen they followed, at least when they were healthy, even if they did admit to not always following the uh, medical advice when they should have done. The letters reveal a continuing concern with diet as a cause as well as a cure for illness, which, as I hope I've demonstrated uh, this evening, helped shape people's food choices uh, throughout the early modern period. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.